Welcome to Peerpoint Perspectives, the securities finance podcast delivering commentary from the best, brightest and most innovative people in the world of securities lending, repo, collateral management and related areas. Peerpoint Perspectives is brought to you by the consulting team at Peerpoint Financial. So now over to your hosts. Hello and welcome to episode eight of Peerpoint Perspectives. I'm Roy Zimmerhansel and I'm your host and I'm practice lead at Peerpoint. On these podcasts, we try to bring you expert commentary, whether that's from the team at Peerpoint or through our guests. Today's show is no different as we're going to look at tax as it relates to securities lending. You know, it's an essential part of the business, but unfortunately, it's also a subject that's been in the news recently for all the wrong reasons. Now, when I've hired consultants in the past, one of the things that I look for is whether someone has been a practitioner. This is particularly true, I think, in complicated and complex areas like securities lending. To me, it just seems that uh, people that only have consulting experience or only have practical experience are at a disadvantage to someone that has both. The reason I I, I mentioned that is that I've known today's guest for approaching 20 years And we met when he was in his role as head of investment tax services at Barclays Global Investors. Of course, uh, BGI was subsequently sold to BlackRock. Um, After that, you know, he moved on to senior roles at EY and Deloitte and has worked in both the UK and the Middle East. So uh, I think you will have seen him uh, across LinkedIn. He's a very avid user. You can follow him and his firms. They've been very active with a diverse set of very high quality webinars that I recommend you join. As always, the links to anything we talk about in the show will be in the show notes. Uh, But look, my, as far as I'm concerned, my best uh, recommendation of someone and really a demonstration of my own confidence in a person's knowledge is really best exemplified by the fact that when I do securities lending training, He's my go-to person to lead the tax segments each time. Uh, And I guess in my own humble little way, that's the best compliment that I can pay someone. Um, I'm really, really happy that he's agreed to join us today. And while I can go on, I think it's about time to introduce my guest. It's Ali Kazimi, Managing Director of Hansuke Consulting. Ali, good morning and welcome to the show. Good morning, Roy. How are you? Yeah, very good. On a bright, sunny day after yesterday's rain and thunderstorm. So, uh, so I think it's a brighter day. Um, listen, Ali, the thing is, you know, you and I, as you know, 20 years ago, we were talking about securities lending and tax. 20 years later, we still are. Um, it just seems to me that this is really part of, part of the business. So, so that's why I've asked you on to the show, because I know that it's really uh, something that's really part of every day of mine. Um, But why do you think listeners uh, should be interested in today's show? Well, firstly, uh, thank you very much for your very kind introduction. It's, um, you know, when it comes from someone like yourself, uh, who's been a doyen of the industry, um, it means a lot more. So thank you for that. Um, Why should listeners be listening? Because unless we really understand how we've got to this point, we cannot decide cannot take decisive action. I mean, one just has to pick up the newspaper on a daily basis and just see where tax and securities lending has got to. So if firms are interested in protecting their reputation, senior management is interested in calibrating and setting the direction for the future, they have to understand what is happening across uh, Europe, what the tax authorities are doing, and what is what has taken shape already in the United States. Yeah. So, and and I think that really frames everything really well. Look, it it's really part of uh, part of the past, present, and future. And and I think uh, you know maybe what we'll talk about today is some of the pending scrutiny and uh, discussion. But look, um, the two things, although they are integral and intertwined, they haven't uh, always been easy uh, bedfellows. So that has why is that, and and has it always been like that? Uh, there have been uneasy bedfellows of late, and uh, I suppose it's the sort of like we're over the seven-year itch, but over a longer period. Um, I mean, traditionally, 
uh, capital markets have been very interested and governments have been very interested in promoting sort of like deep and liquid capital markets. And the tax legislation, uh, the rules and regulations, have basically followed uh, that broader policy perspective to have deep and liquid uh, uh, markets. So the way you can achieve that is by uh, eliminating any tax leakage or any tax sort of like um, drags to a uh, fully functioning securities lending market. And if you look at, say, for example, the legal easements that have been put in place on something as simple as the classification of the loan going out and its return, is that going to be treated as a chargeable disposal, both going out and coming back? And those are the type of challenges that we have had to contend with. Look, that's, and, and, and I think I just really want to touch on that because people don't always appreciate the importance of that. So is am, am I correct that that particularly becomes important in the event of obviously ongoing activity, but it becomes particularly of a concern in the event of an insolvency where a, a judge might view this not as a securities loan, but actually as a you know sale uh, and acquisition. Absolutely. I mean, I will talk to the insolvency, but the general principle has to be established first. And that's what legislation has done. And if I can give you an a interesting story, um, as the institution doesn't exist, it does, it's fine if I can say that. I was consulting with a particular um, uh, agency lender, and I was there on a Friday afternoon. Uh, this is uh, September 2008. And somebody came to me and asked me that question. What would happen if we have sent out a loan to a borrower and the bor borrower goes under? What would happen? And I, and I just looked at this person and I just thought, well, that's never happened. You know, why are you asking such an odd question? And, um, and I said, well, I suppose, you know, what would happen is that it would, uh, from a UK tax perspective, it was UK securities, the stamp duty would become payable because the stamp duty exemption, it, the way it was framed was loans going out and coming back. So you had to have both legs present. And lo and behold, on Monday morning, whatever, over the weekend, it was announced that Lehman was going to go under. So, yes, of course, it becomes really important. And you've seen post Lehman, a lot of tax legislations change just to take into account that insolvency scenario. Right. So that's one of the fundamental principles. Uh, and I guess this applies equally in a new market. We can't go into a new market unless we understand how the transaction is treated from a legal perspective, right? Yeah, I mean, you use the term legal, but, you know, being a uh, practitioner, actually what a tax person has to do is a bit more complicated than just the legal analysis because what you've got, in essence, is the legal analysis usually relies on what we call form. So if you do certain things in a particular fa fashion, then there is an inherent uh, integrity that the outcome will be as follows. So that's the legal approach. The accounting approach is the second approach, which is a far more pragmatic approach. So you look at the substance of transaction. So if you do, a, say, for example, a repo over a uh, balance sheet date, you will not treat that as a sort of like disposal of securities, you're looking at substance or reforms. You say this is a financing transaction and you wouldn't take it off balance sheet. Now tax has to, is it, is the child of both law, the legal approach and accounting. And you have to navigate your way. And it could sometimes go into the form, like it does when say stamp tax is a concern, or it could follow the accounting approach. And therefore when you go into new markets, you have to systematically go and sort of like look at a series of questions, you know, um, and you do not lend until you've gone through this. One is how will the transaction, the loan and the return be treated? Is it going to be a capital gains or an income tax principles? You look at the, ta the tax treatment of the manufactured substitute payment that will arise you know, under the loan. You look at the classification of collateral. That's one area that quite often people miss. 
the loan fees itself, and also sort of like there may be other uh, transfer taxes, stamp taxes that may be prevalent in that market. I haven't mentioned the I word, the indemnity, but we'll come to that later, I'm sure. Right. So thanks. I think that gives us quite a nice framework. So it's, I get it's kind of what you're really saying is that uh, you've got the hard and fast rules of whatever the legal interpretation is. You've got the mathematical calculations of the accounting side of it. And you're kind of saying uh, tax is almost the art of marrying the two up to make certain things get treated. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, exactly. And you, that's a difficult navigation because, you know, if you're dealing with, I don't know, Israeli securities and you the, the borrower is in London and uh, the lender is in the Middle East, you've got three different jurisdictions having different, you know, and sometimes it could be symmetric. Because somebody may go more towards the accounting, some may go towards the legal. And that's why it needs to be really carefully architected. Okay, well, look, I, I think that's a good framework. So it seems pretty straightforward. And uh, I'm surprised then that uh, issues arise. But the, uh, the tide seems to have uh, turned lately. Um, again, you know, can you give us some kind of perspective as to how we've ended up where we are today? Yes. Uh, and for me, dates are really important. I mean, it's like being a, a student of history because it actually sort of like tells you when were the turning points, the tipping points in history. And for me, the, the key date in the 20 odd years that we've known each other, we've been in the industry was uh, around, uh, was actually September 11, 2008. You asked, so in, in the few days, in the few days before Lehman, so as everyone was scrambling around trying to uh, determine whether Lehman was going to live or die, um, you know, I had uh, the platform I was at, I had some of my trading partners saying, I don't want to trade with Lehman. I had others saying, look, we're prepared to trade with Lehman on a DVP basis. And so people were scrambling around and you're saying something else was happening at the same time? Indeed. And this was momentous stuff. This was um, McCarthy-style uh, Senate uh, hearings. A uh, subcommittee of the Senate was holding these hearings under a um, uh, Senator Carl Levin. Carl Levin is a very big name in the United States. He has uh, been... Uh, he has views on taxation, um, and he basically felt that uh, essentially there was systematic tax abuse taking place in the United States, and he had essentially all the Wall Street sort of like movers and shakers come in and uh, you know uh, subject, subjected them to a public hearing, and the report was issued on September 11, 2008, and because of the reason that you sort of like you were busy with the Lehman stuff going on. It got, you know, the bad news got covered uh, by even worse news. And uh, this report wasn't picked up by the general uh, media. But, you know, if it had been for Lehman, this would have been the report to go to. And it's still there. I mean, I would still encourage people to go and have a read. It's a really good summary of what, how tax authorities think, how government uh, bodies think. Well, what was the objective of it or what was the outcome or the recommendations or or what was the impact of that sure um so most of you know that sort of like the, in the united states uh, the irs basically imposes a 30 percent uh, tax on uh dividends on u.s equities okay that's the standard sort of like 30 percent holding now and another key date was back in 1997 so there was something in the industry that was known as Notice 9766. Uh, that was, again, a radical step forward in taken uh, by the American government. Basically, it, it said that the rule, it's, it reframed the rules on the character and sourcing of loan transactions, security loan transactions. So basically, they said that if you make a payment by reference to an underlying U.S. security, a securities loan transaction, that payment will have the source and character of the underlying. And that's really odd because, you know, they could be, say, for example, Roy, you and I decide to take a uh, uh, bet over 
the horse race that's going to take place in Hong Kong uh, Jockey Club. Okay. Now, we're entering into a bilateral transaction that has no nexus in Hong Kong except that we're making that payment by reference to a particular horse coming in. Now, nobody in their right mind would say that, you know, that transaction between you and me sitting in London should be subject to Hong Kong taxation. But that's essentially what the Americans did. And that then then grew. So that was the sort of like on loan transaction. The Americans had already established that in 1997. But what was happening, it was quite interesting, you'll find, uh, is that to circumvent those specific source and characterization rules, you had hedge funds. Just before dividend payment date, they would empty their whole inventory to a U.S. broker-dealer. The U.S. broker-dealer would essentially write them a synthetic contract to pay back or give them the, the U.S. dividend that they had received. The Cayman Fund obviously cannot you know, take advantage of a double taxation treaty, so it doesn't get the 85 or anything like that. It suffers a 30% holding. And just after the dividend date, that whole sandwich trade, as it was known, was would get unwound. So you would get the uh, the synthetic unwound, and you would take the securities, the cash equities, and push them back to the Cayman Hedge Fund. And that's what Levin was really upset about. And he had recordings. He had he actually had emails, and that's why I say go to the report, and you will see some very interesting institutional names there, people that you and I know. Uh, being cited. Yeah, and I think the sources for some of these things uh, were actually also additionally you know, known known individuals. So, so it was uh, it was certainly an interesting time. So, so what was the outcome of that then? Like, how, how did how did things play out? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure sort of like the market practitioners that you deal with, they have uh, issued of the new rules. These are the dividend equivalent rules that the IRS has introduced, also known as Section 871M. So 871M basically aligns the U.S. taxation of dividend equivalents. By dividend equivalents, they, they refer to both uh, payments that are made uh, under uh, loans of U.S. securities but also includes the synthetic payments with the underlying references to U.S. securities. So what you've done is you've got the cash equities, you've got securities lending sort of like uh, substitute in EU payments, and you've got sort of like the synthetic payments. And they basically put an equal sign next to each one of them and say all three of them are subject to U.S. 30% withholding tax. And this is a momentous development because this is a global and as I mentioned, uh, Carl Levin's report, um, dividend tax abuse, as known as, if you just type it up, Google Levin and put dividend tax abuse, it makes for interesting bedtime reading. Right. So the outcome of it is, uh, irrespective of how you hold things, uh, the taxation impact will be uh, equivalent. Exactly. I mean, we have had, uh, without going into all the detailed tax technica technicalities, I and mean, a lot of people in the industry have found that really difficult uh, to implement. It's easy to do on the, say, for example, the cash equities. It's easy to do on the um, on the on loan positions, but particularly for synthetics, you're now having to delve into systems which are about sort of like looking at delta measures, and you know how do you calculate the delta on a basket and so on, and how do you link it with the US? So these are all fun and games that are yet to come into play. And must be increasingly complicated as a bigger proportion of the securities finance business is done through synthetics. Absolutely. So. It is becoming very difficult. Um, I mean, you've had you've got the tracker system in the United States, so that makes it slightly easier for the on-loan securities. You obviously have to go through a U.S. broker dealer for that. Uh, but on the synthetic side, that's where a lot of the, sort of like the difficult uh, difficulties are on the U.S. loan side. So this is sort of like, I think that it's quite interesting that the U.S. Uh, case study, if I can call it, shows where there was a clearly what was perceived by the U.S. authorities as market abuse and then corrective 
uh, measures have been introduced to uh, to correct to basically remediate that mischief. And the U.S. So that, isn't the only market. Okay, tell me more. Which, which other markets are are looking at, at that or have done it? Well, I mean, there was uh, something just basically uh, in news broke uh, this week about uh, uh, Morgan Stanley uh, uh, allegedly owing more than uh, forty-two million dollars to the Dutch tax authorities. And uh, it made me smile because, um, you know, in the 1990s, it's quite funny, the Dutch tax authorities became rather uh, uh, sensitive over what they saw as uh, abusive dividend stripping transactions. Okay. Uh, what you do is essentially sort of like you would uh, take, take, take a uh, on loan position, you lend it out into the Dutch market. So you'd have the big Dutch players borrow, take the dividend to the market, collect the dividend in a domestic tax setting, which was beneficial, and then return and then share the benefits with the uh, offshore lenders. So that was a dividend stripping transaction. And well, it, uh, go ahead. Carry yeah, on. I was going to say it's a, it, why I why I smile is the, the Dutch tax authorities called all the big Dutch banks and they said. Guys, this really must stop. You know, you know, Dutch people are very, you know, very plain speaking people. They basically said, we're giving you a year to fix your house. After that, if you don't fix your house, we're bringing legislation to really sort of like clamp down. Now, most people would have taken that as a salutary sort of like lesson and, uh, you know, fix things. What actually happened was, the, the guys, the bankers, after after hearing this, they went back and they said, boys, to, to the trading desk, we have only one year to make as much money as we can. And they filled their boots with the stuff. And it's really, it was an aggressive sort of like a machinery that they started putting into action. Obviously, you can imagine the Dutch tax authorities weren't too pleased uh, afterwards. Yeah, that, uh, that that's quite funny. I, I I want to come back to that in the context of what's happening with the uh, EBA, uh, which we'll talk about subsequently. But but look, am I am I correct or not in thinking that uh, with the respect to the U.S. and the Dutch sort of trading back and forth, that also led to uh, a renegotiation on the double taxation um, agreements, so, and so didn't that lead to um, uh, it, it, basically, the reduction of withholding tax between um, between the two countries. It did indeed, and what has happened is, whilst some of the the double taxation agreement did provide for a lower rate and so on, what uh, has happened generally across the double taxation agreements is that the in order to claim the benefit, you have few more hurdles and it's quite interesting i mean if you look at say for example the uk swiss treaty now you have to tick a box under a double taxation agreement uh, sorry if you're making a claim on, under the dta that says that these uh dividends that i'm basically claiming uh reduced treaty benefit for are not pursuing to a underlying securities lending transaction so what you've essentially led to is what was double taxation agreements by definition are about removing double taxation agreements. Sorry, removing double taxation. They've now become a device for preventing tax benefits to be granted. So it's the opposite. So they've become like gatekeepers. And that's what you've seen systematically the different double taxation agreements do partially because of some of these measures. Look, I, I think that's really interesting. And I think if there's a trend that we've seen since 2000, really, it is that kind of clarification. Because I guess when I first started talking to people about tax, I thought, well, this is pretty straightforward. Something's either liable to tax or it isn't. And then they're saying, well, look, the tax legislation is very broad brush. And it, and it sets out rules and uh, principles uh, and when you get down to the individual application in a specific transaction, 
it's it's less effective because it's by definition very broad and that's what makes it open to potential abuse and so i guess what you're talking about now with these kind of uh these kind of uh, changes in philosophy is to specifically target um potential for abuse and say ah that particular thing so we still got the rules in place that specific thing you tell us that uh it's uh th- that you are not doing it subject to that because by definition then if you are lying you are abusing the system yeah but i mean i have a really interesting story and uh, we the, the rules of the game have changed fundamentally in taxation and the philosophical discussion is a very important one which is about you know what is tax evasion what is tax avoidance and what is aggressive tax planning or tax uh, sort of like abuse now in the old days and i'm talking about sort of like you know when i was starting off my career in the er- very early 90s uh, I, I was with a one of the largest uh, accounting firms, and there was one particular partner in our New York office. And we would sort of like he was the go-to guy for securities um, finance transaction. He, I, in fact, I you know I'm looking at my uh, bookcase. I can see a book by this guy. I mean, he was a fantastic tax brain, and I remember in the very sort of like towards the late 90s, the same guy was basically, you know, the, the federal agents had come and they ha- had him with uh, handcuffs taking him into court. And it was quite interesting sort of like from a f- philosophical discussion because he said, I've done nothing wrong. The tax... Uh, legislators gave me the legislation. They had all the powers to make the rules. And if I can find gaps in the legislation, that clearly indicates to me it was not the intention of the legislator to fill those gaps. Otherwise, they would have provided for it. They would have written it in. So a brilliant tax brain essentially being essentially turned into a felon. And that basically was sort of like a wake-up lesson for us because we thought, gosh, if someone like him can fall, you know, where do the rest of us sit? So I think there is that whole debate still there underlying. But I think what's happened is because the tax authorities have been so heavy-handed, we're basically just cowered under and we just do not push it. Now, I'm not saying that the industry was clean either. I mean, I gave you the case of the Dutch story you know when we start you know when you know the tax authority is sensitive you go and sort of like tickle them you're not going to find you know they're not going to find it amusing so i think there is a fundamental issue in play but where we have got to because we've we've seen that tax authorities are serious we, we have changed our approach to things as well we're not being uh we're basically staying very far away from that borderline because we have seen financial institutions also change their own appetite as well. And also the appetite of underlying beneficial owners is sort of like changing as well. Yeah, let's come back to beneficial owners in a little bit. But, you know, this what you've described reminds me of, uh, on, a, on a personal note, what's happened in the UK over the last few years where chartered surveyors valuing homes uh, are now under a, a much uh, higher degree of scrutiny in terms of valuing properties. And since they are now at risk of falling afoul of the regulations, they just mark down the values of everyone's home, right? Tell, tell me what the rules are. I'll tell you how people will act. You know, if you're going to be uh, optimistic rather than aggressive, and that will penalize you, well, you're going to be conservative. And, and that sort of marks everything down. So in that case, the value of homes and mortgages uh, and therefore house prices. Uh, in this case, uh, the amount of activity that happens and the potential profitability of, uh, uh, of it for banks and therefore the returns for beneficial owners. Seems strange to me because the whole reason that uh, we have regulators in place is to set those boundaries in terms of what's acceptable practice what's not acceptable practice, and then a rule set. Without a rule set, 
you can't determine how you run your business. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, you know, it, without being too philosophical, but I will give you an example. One is clearly tax evasion, which is a crime. We know that, yes. There is um, that which is permissible, you know, legitimate tax avoidance. If a double taxation agreement is in place, you observe certain rules, then, you know, you've met all the requirements, go in, get it. Okay, But I think sort of like where it fell in between, but was clearly on the, on the wrong side, is perhaps what was... Uh, what took place in Denmark. Uh, SCAT, the, the, the Danish tax authority, uh, you know, had a very sobering experience between 2012 and 2015. A, a certain hedge fund um, with a, the manager sitting in London, basically, um, you know, basically uh, defrauded the, the Danish tax authorities to the tune of 1.7 billion euros. That's a phenomenal amount of money from the Dan Danish exchequer. Okay. And it, in the aftermath math of that, I mean, you know, it's, it's pretty public knowledge and so on. In fact, there's a high court case going on as we speak in London, where, uh, you know, the Danish tax authorities did try to uh, get hold of the gentleman who's now uh, living in Dubai, and they, they, they basically, it proved very difficult because the, the UAE government wasn't willing to extradite. But what's interesting is then there was a sort of like discussion between the, the Brits and the Danes as to where should the prosecution take place. Now, that all of that kind of the criminal side of things fell away. And what you're now seeing in London's High Court is the Danish tax authority basically um, uh, pursuing a claim against solar capital partners. And, uh, you know, we'll see where it gets to. But what it led to was, you know, I talked about what happened in the United States. I mean, this is the equivalent mischief in Europe because in its aftermath, what you're seeing is a systematic, uh, what well, was terribly embarrassing, first of all, for the Danish tax authorities that they didn't even see dividend claims being sort of like made of them. Um, uh, but also what you saw was systematically in its aftermath, European governments took steps to, you know, limit such trading activities and, uh, and there's been a fundamental change in Danish fiscal law uh, to fix this kind of thing. And what you were essentially getting is double dips or, you know, sort of like you were claiming for things which you weren't entitled to. Right. And as you say, that's, you know, clearly if you're claiming something you're not entitled to, uh, and you should have the market knowledge that you're not entitled to it, then that's that's clearly uh, tax abuse. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything all that. I mean, if you have a dividend claim arising, um, and just because you and I enter into a transaction, uh, we can't both sort of like be claiming on the same dividend. And that's essentially what you had. You had a, a whole operation that was manufacturing essentially illegal. It was defrauding because it was illegal uh, dividend receipts. Yeah, and look, I, I wrote a blog post recently where I, where I proposed the suggestion that if, uh, if I'm trying to uh, be involved in a transaction where I know there will be two claims on a single dividend payment, uh, I, I think it would be hard for me to argue that uh, I didn't uh, I, I wasn't aware that it uh, it was unlikely to be within the uh, context of the the the, um, the rules. Yeah, that was actually a very interesting uh, blog post. I, I read it with great interest, and I would certainly recommend that people do dip into it because it's quite interesting. Because the approach that you take in this is from a market practitioner side, and how these tax rules or whatever. How do you take them and implement it? So I think that's a really useful document. Thank you.
Yeah, because I think what we want to do is we want to, although we've talked about a lot of negative um, situations here, the reality is, you know, the regulators and politicians, you know, generally, uh, perhaps not always, but generally are there to try and have appropriate treatment of transactions so that, you know, the business, the business is conducted and taxes are raised appropriately, not excessively and and close as many loopholes as possible for uh, tax abuse and and evasion. So so I think they come with good intentions. It does impact the the marketplace, but but the point of the blog post and uh, I guess what we can talk about with respect to the EBA is if if this was clear cut uh, business that said anytime there's a dividend involved. Uh, there's a problem, then it would all be shut down and it isn't. So that means there must be some kind of an acceptable framework that allows the business to carry on. Well, that's quite an interesting thing because at the moment on the German side is the whole uh, comics and com contracts that have been dominating that, you know, sort of like the Germans have got something like 100 banks under investigation as we speak. And it's quite interesting because in its aftermath, uh, whether it was right or wrong, whatever, that debate was pushed to the side. And you look at an institution like Commerce Bank and basically they just withdrew from the market because they felt that's not something from a risk perspective they want to do anymore, um, which is, you know, obviously I can't comment on what was going on, but it's an interesting thing. Uh, to note how firms are dealing with that. And some tax authorities have come up with very prescriptive rules. Germany itself, you know, it's known as the 45-day rule, which operates on either side. So you can't essentially benefit from a tax, the German tax treaty if you haven't held the security for, you know, 90 days, basically. And that's really sort of like, you know, so now you're getting houses having to keep a track record of what the holding period is off the security uh, when it straddles a uh, dividend payment date, okay, uh, on loan securities. So you're getting these type of sort of like systems requirements now coming in. And the question now becomes is, well, if I'm observing it for Germany and it's 45, is there a explicit rule like that in, say, for example, France? And technically there isn't, but we're now observing, we're giving the, you know, many institutions are saying is, okay, I'm not going to go to 45 days, but what I'll do is I'll set it at 15 days on either side. Because then I can sort of like demonstrate to that tax authority that that wasn't my intention. So you're getting different types of tax driven behaviors coming in sort of like, you know, um, the idea of exclusives that basically detaches from, uh, you know, the inventory is available, you dip into it as and when required. So you, the lender is pushing the responsibility onto the borrower or the, the lending agent who's taken to the market. So the, you're getting new operational procedures arising in relation to taxation. So there's a, always a potential here for knock-on impact on what's happening in one market uh, becoming a concern for the regulators or the tax authorities in another market, irrespective of whether something like that's going on there or not. And you you end up having this sort of cumulative, uh, in some cases, paranoia, uh, I, I think. Um, so that kind of goes into the whole reputational risk element of it. You, you mentioned it very briefly earlier in our conversation. And I have to say, in talking to beneficial owners, uh, for them, they're always concerned about any potential pushback uh, as a result of tax-related transactions and securities lending. Is that is that a legitimate concern? And if it is a legitimate concern, is it something that uh, that can be managed uh, effectively? Very much so. Um, and you know, I mentioned my my own experience. My career started looking very much at a transactional level that at that time what we thought was permissible and now it's sort of like at this stage in my career a lot of my work is really around the tax integrity side of things 
which is really about eking out and understanding where does the tax risk reside. So one has to understand who are the actors, who are the players in this. And you've already mentioned the tax authorities. As I said, sort of like the tax authorities have their own uh, you know, risk that they must carry. Okay. Obviously, the tax authorities are trying to defray that risk onto the uh, to the market, and you would get a series. You would get the borrower, you would get the lending agent, and then you get the beneficial owner. Now, most of our discussion I'm going to now explain is in the context of agency lending business, but we're not talking about principal uh, sort of like uh, conduit lending arrangements. They bring their own sort of like uh, uh, tax risk, but generally. Uh, the beneficial owners have become a lot more sensitive to taxation. And you mentioned the Lehman story um, with all the sort of like issues that happened in the aftermath of it. You know, the, the uh, collateral transformation trades, the sort of like uh, collateral sort of like reinvestment uh, structures and things like that. People became very averse, and I was dealing with a particular sort of like uh, one of the largest Middle Eastern uh, uh, sovereigns who actually withdrew from the market uh, after Lehman's. And one of the conditions that the investment committee had put was we will not come back into the market or start lending sort of like and make our inventories available until we have a sign off by, you know, myself. And I had to present to the to the committee. So at that point, they basically asked exactly that question, Roy, which was, whose risk is it? Is it our risk? Is the risk that of the agent or the borrower? But the borrower may be sort of like, you know, may have a different risk appetite. They could be sitting in king. Okay. So where does it sit? And I think sort of like the general view is it is the agents who are basically taking the uh, the beneficial owners to market that they should have done the market due diligence whilst the underlying risk will always be with the beneficial owner because they're the owner of the securities. But they expect and they have got now, you know, I basically draft these kind of sort of like side letters, tax risk side letters, which basically spell out what they can do, what they can't do. So there's a lively sort of like discussion that takes place between lending agents and uh, beneficial owners as to what elements and who owns what risk, because there are different types of risks as well. So one is to do with very simply to do with, so is it complete and accurate, the returns or whatever, okay, which is reporting, if you could call it accounting. Then there are tax judgments. So we talk about new markets. So if you're taking me, you know, you're going to, you know, take me, to, you know, the lending program is now going to have uh, Israel is going to go live with Israeli securities. There is a question as to have you done enough due diligence and so on. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I mean, look, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts on sort of the following perspective. You know, the abuse really can only occur when someone claims an entitlement that it's determined that they aren't entitled to. And so I, I guess at the simplistic stage, it could just be denied and you wouldn't get the benefit of that. And then the next stage goes, well, you intentionally structured it in a way that you would claim for something that it was clear that you weren't entitled to. And so therefore, you know, I've always looked at it that the, the abuse happens at the time when someone claim something that they aren't entitled to. And anyone downstream that hasn't made any claim hasn't really violated anything because they have no they have no control due to the transfer of title characteristic of the securities loan uh, as to what a subsequent user of the securities does with those securities. Absolutely. I mean, you, it's, you know, John Lewis doesn't take responsibility for you know, how is the television used? Is it used for uh, educational purposes or is it for, you know, something more salacious? I mean, it's not 
they're not responsible for that. So I think there is an element of sort of like, I'm handing things over to you now. Now you're the uh, legal owner of these securities. What you do with them, and that's where the, the you know, they have the power to divest and do as they see fit. So you're quite right. The the beneficial owner cannot be held responsible for what happens, you know, downstream. Having said that, I would sort of like say there are a couple of measures, and we can talk about these. There is something called uh, DAC six, which has come into the fore. Before DAC six, DAC six is being talked about now that it goes live this year. But before that, you had the UK corporate criminal offence, which is quite interesting because that's what's called a strict liability offence, which means that in legal speak, you don't need to have mens rea, a guilty intention. So it's not about did you know or you didn't know, whether you had the intention for this to happen or not. But if you essentially allowed yourself to be used in a fashion, you or your employees, basically, or your agents, which resulted in the perpetrating of a tax crime, then you are guilty unless you can demonstrate to the tax authorities that you had instituted reasonable prevention procedures. And that has really put the cat amongst the pigeons because now it's just not good enough for you to say, well, you know, I'm just a banking facility and I just didn't know where the money was coming in. But did you have procedures to sort of like detect anything suspicious? That's where the, where the thinking is going now. Yeah, and, and again, a story from my own experience, the way that we dealt with that prior to the German regulations coming into effect, this 45-day rule you were talking about, we knew that something was going to happen to change it, right? It wasn't going to be allowed to carry on the way it had been. And so in order to do exactly what you just talked about, avoid as much as possible the potential for a conflict, we just wouldn't lend German securities to German borrowers on the basis that, uh, you know, if we were lending it to German borrowers, there is a, a potential thought that you could say, well, look, you gave German securities to the hands of someone that could fraudulently claim a, a, a tax credit. Um, and so you must have had some degree of belief that that was, that was potential. So uh, we just tried to avoid that by saying that we're just going to lend it to someone else who knows what they do with it, you know, but they, they, they would have to proactively do something beyond just holding on to it that would create a, a, an abuse potential situation. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Well, listen, we've talked, we talked about uh, referenced uh, Cumex files uh, on a couple of occasions. That's the big story. It's raised the concern over uh, uh, tax abuse it, with respect to securities lending transactions. You know, I've always, I've always looked at this as securities lending is just a legal structure. It's a transaction type. It's not, you know, it's not a culprit in anything, you know, the, going back to what we were talking about before, you can use a van as uh, an ambulance, or you can use a van uh, to smash through barriers, uh, but it's still just a van. I, I look at security lending in the same way. But Comex Files, uh, a big issue, thrown the spotlight on the business again. Uh, can you tell us maybe what the issue was? Why is it a problem? And we'll explore it from there. Sure. I mean, I think, again, contextually, Germany is Europe's largest economy. And what you see is, you know, following the financial crisis, uh, the, the first financial crisis, obviously, we're living through one that we speak. Um, so the latest uh, scandal to have emerged from that financial crisis was the COMEX deals, okay? And it, it, it was big. Just as I mentioned to you, sort of like, you know, there's uh, up to 100 banks under investigation by German tax authorities in relation to the COMEX deals. And uh, basically, the deals involved uh, illicit tax refunds, uh, which have cost the German state, you know, up to uh, $12 billion. I mean, that's a massive number. I mean, if we look at the what I said about the Danes, which at 1.7 billion euros, this is a completely different magnitude. 
and uh, you know I've mentioned certain German banks already uh, changing their uh, their practices fundamentally boards and things being re re-engineered and so on so these are tax driven share transactions which take place around the dividend record date and they were allegedly sort of like executed by banks between you know in the year 2001 to 2011 and they were trading on their own account as well as sort of like uh, third parties and these uh, comics trades specifically involved acquiring shares you know come div shares basically with the, the dividend embedded uh, that was due on or just before the dividend record date and you they basically delivered these shares after the record date without the dividend which made it possible basically for multiple uh, returns of capital gains tax uh, that had only been paid to the German tax authorities once okay so you got multiple claims basically going on because you're taking advantage of that timing difference and that was quite systematic again sort of like you know everybody thought this was you know how can one dividend have seven claims it's crazy um, now after the comex trades basically the authorities also started investigating what they call the come come deals these involved a short-term transfer of loans or shares owned by a foreign company or investors to a domestic German bank, which then subsequently applied for a tax refund or dividend, uh, which would not have been available to the foreign uh, beneficial owner or broker. So that's where the 45-day rule came in for the come come transactions. So these are the two transaction types which basically were uh, in play in Germany and the you know the after effects of that are still taking place right and one of those after after effects is uh the eba recently uh, the european banking authority recently put out a uh, a paper about dividend arbitrage in europe and they're you know they have challenged tax authorities to review their markets for dividend arbitrage activity domestically and and to take appropriate action so uh, what's that how is that likely to uh, play out over the the coming uh, years I guess yeah before I go to the EBA paper I think because I want to locate the discussion to the tax developments first if I may which is the, the Finnish tax authority at the moment is currently investigating a paper, uh, a paperless sort of like refund procedure, a simplified refund procedure that in Europe has come to be known as TRACE, T-R-A-C-E. Um, and that would make obtaining uh, tax reclaims much simpler, okay? And part of the challenge that they have are these COMEX trades because they're basically designing their system so to prevent that systematically and the rest of Europe is watching because they are thinking about how they can then take that uh, pilot if I can call it and apply it across the European Union because in the background you've got the bigger um, uh, the CMU the, the, capital market the union. that's yeah. right the capital markets union program going on as well and one of the things that's been identified in the Capital Markets Union uh, program is that if, unless Europe can sort out uh, and have simplified taxation uh, reclaims, that will hamper the development of the uh, the, the, the common uh, 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 the Capital Markets Union. You know, because as you know, the, the Italians have a different pay dates to. Uh, attitudes to tax repayments than say for example the Danes. Yeah, and you know I can tell you about Italian tax uh, <laughs> repayments uh, from now for another another hour. Um but yeah so it's the it's the asymmetry of of treatment and processing that's yeah. that's the issue, right? So that's and the, the tax sorry go ahead. of the agreements are, are meant to be that they're uh, they're bilaterally symmetrical, right? So, 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 so everyone gets treated consistently. 
Exactly, exactly. So that's on the the tax side of things. But you're quite right. The, there's a broader um, EBA paper, which is actually sort of like, and this is a key theme that I will, you know, my takeaway points I will raise, which is around what that EBA paper do, has done is actually slightly, subtly, whilst it was tax that gave rise to this issue, they're not positioning it as a tax issue. They've posited it as a financial crime or a market abuse issue. And that is a much bigger philosophical development, conceptual development, that we will see how it pans itself out. Because up till now, it was people like the tax departments who were coming in and sort of like saying to the, you know, within lending agents or uh, in, in PBEs and uh, broker dealer houses, and the shifting ground and saying is, well, actually, this is this needs to be managed by compliance. So that's going to be an interesting watch. Yeah, because they've, as you say, they've attached it as a financial crime. And so it falls into the same scope of, uh, of, of uh, processing regulation oversight as um, uh, anti-money laundering. Exactly. And it's kind of, they've, they've kind of grouped the activities together. Mm. So, yeah, and you've got the SFTR and all of that stuff going on. So I think it's quite interesting that you're getting these, uh, these shifts, these functional shifts taking place around what's happening. And I think that might be because they want it to be operationalized rather than sort of like, because quite often tax departments are under-resourced and they give more tax rulings, internal rulings, rather than do the processing. Yeah, it just seems to me that with the the goal of increased transparency, uh, and uh, SFTR is a good example. <clears throat> That's the Securities Finance Transactions Regu- uh, Reporting Regulations. It seems to me that if you have if you start with LEIs, the legal entity identifiers identifying who's party to every transaction, you go down to the granular per transaction level and every change along the way through the life cycle of that transaction. Uh, it becomes a, a different kind of universe where you can, in theory, uh, track all of these transactions in the same way that with if you move to digital currency, you can always and, – and a government-sponsored digital currency, the government can see everything that you're actually doing. Exactly. It strikes me that this has potential for the same kind of treatment in future. Exactly. I, and I see that happening. I mean, what, what, what to me is interesting, and I don't have an answer to this, is – you know, sort of like some of the developments that took place last week, because, I mean, are we going to see a divergence between the United Kingdom and the rest of Europe? Now, a lot of people are cheering and saying, this is great. This means that we have less, uh, it's less onerous, but also sort of like, I think UK or London's ability to be the center of the global center of securities lending, you you know, uh, it would be interesting to get your view on that, Roy. I mean, you know, where do we position ourselves? Look, I, I think that I think there's a challenge. One of the one of the arguments always in favor of, of Brexit from this community's point of view is that there is always the potential for asymmetry for a U.S. bank or a Swiss bank that wasn't part of the EU to uh, trade under different conditions than members that would be captured by the EU. And you could find yourself in a position where you would be at a regulatory disadvantage if you were an EU-based bank. So by coming out of the EU, the UK, in theory, could present itself uh, as, uh, as a country with, with sound regulation and oversight, but not necessarily disadvantage itself uh, from a regulatory point of view. And, and this seems to be uh, the first... Um, the first inklings of that kind of an approach uh, with respect to CSDR, the uh, Central Securities Depositories uh, regulations, um, and and the avoidance of buy-in. So <clears throat> I think we have a potential for a reshaping of, mm. of the competitive landscape and, and appropriate regulations. Yeah, I mean, I think which is across all regulatory things, my view is also that what we need to do you know, if I was talking to UK PLC, I would be saying, look, let's really hash out the equivalence measures. 
so that we can continue and we can continue to hold that leadership position. Yeah, and and look, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had Sean Murray from Margin Reform on the podcast, and we were mm-hmm. talking about the uncleared margin rules. And the difference about those rules is that is a truly global regulation. Mm-hmm. So although it's, it's rolled out domestically in each country, everyone will be captured under the same rule set and the same size firms will be captured in each of the appropriate phases. That's a global rule. <clears throat> the potential is, is again, this, this dislocation between rules that apply in Europe uh, to, and does that only apply to Europeans or people dealing with Europeans or European securities or European collateral or, or what? <clears throat> I think I think that just overly complicates things and and it requires maybe a cons- a more consistent thought out approach. Indeed, absolutely. But there you go, Look, Ali. I think I think that's been great. I, I'm not curious. Uh, I'm not certain whether you want to add anything more on DAX six. Uh, which you touched on briefly. Sure. Um, DAX 6 is a latest measure across Europe, which uh, basically, um, if it goes to plan, it will actually get rolled out to other OECD countries as well. So it's basically mandatory disclosure of uh, certain cross-border arrangements. Now, these cross-border arrangements must fulfill one uh, specified hallmark and, uh, you know, Isla has been doing quite a bit of work on this as well. Um, but it's still early days and people are having to think about, you know, how and what they're going to have to report under DAC6. Um, it's, a, it's a big measure. The key thing, you know, without making it into a massive uh, uh, DAC6 sort of like session, um, I would say that impact assessments should have been conducted because it applies to what's termed EU intermediaries. And in some cases, it can also apply to um, the taxpayers, the end taxpayers, where there may have been um, a cross-border arrangement um, involving aggressive tax um, planning around EU taxes. So you could have non-EU players also caught up in this. So it's a, it's a big uh, measure, needs to be looked at, and clearly securities lending is certainly within the frame. Now, whether uh, there's anything reportable or not, that's what the impact assessment will basically determine. I think that's where the market is. Uh, the, de- the reporting deadlines have just been announced, have been deferred by uh, six months uh, by the EU uh, in re- Uh, because of uh, COVID-19 sort of like challenges, but nonetheless one to look out for. If I may, I mean, um, Roy, I know we're coming towards the end of the discussion, but if I may just go back to that point that you just highlighted, which is the the symmetry and the global challenges that are there. You know, whether it's DAX6 or whether it's some other measure, I think the key takeaway point from my perspective is that, you know, whether you're a borrower, whether you're a uh, a lending agent or a beneficial owner, the key thing is, unlike in the past, where it was very much grassroots driven, people took views just by virtue of who was sitting on the desk, what their thing was. There now needs to be, and Germany has demonstrated this, there needs to be a top-down approach, which basically means there needs to be a very clear articulation of what are the tax risks, what is your tax governance, and what judgment calls you're going to make. What you can't rely on, and this is what, you know, as I said, you go and have a read of what the tax abuse report by Carl Levin basically says. What you can't have is, individual dealers taking a position on something as big as this, where the firm's reputation and ultimately financials are concerned. And I think that's probably a sensible uh, approach, despite despite the grief that that will no doubt, no doubt cause. Um, 
Thank, thanks, Ed. Um, I want I mentioned in the introduction your series of webinars, so I, I'm wondering if we can turn to that as maybe our closing point here. Uh, you do uh, a, a huge array of them. I'm, I'm surprised uh, that you're not actually an events company. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I look at them. There's you mentioned COVID nineteen and sort of returning to the office. Uh, you have this hedge tax Tuesday. Uh, you've had things on uh, diversity and inclusivity. Can you tell me why wh- why are you doing these? And uh, tell us how you came up with the different topics and, and sort of focus issues. Sure. I mean, I think uh, rather like yourself, Roy, I mean, you, one gets to uh, a point in one's uh, career where you've got all that cumulative knowledge and experience. You've seen so much and that you feel compelled that, you know, there's something bigger than all of us, uh, you know, whether it's the diversity agenda. Um, we've had a view on this, and I think sort of like our industry has got some really good examples there. Um, so the whole thing was to actually go back and talk about our values, talk about the things that are important to us. And the webinar sort of like is a important vehicle in that. First of all, it allows us to connect with people because I think that's what we're finding in C19. We're physically removed from each other, from our own colleagues, from our counterparts and so on. So having a venue where we can come in, which is what you're doing now, you're bringing something to a community and building that community is a very important. We must continue to talk, both listen, which is very important, and also share. And that's really what the idea behind the webinars was. And the the beauty of it is getting some really good people, people who you really respect. And uh, I've threatened to um, put you on one of the webinars soon, so I hope you will be able to accept that. I think I'd be I'd be I'd be honored to be to be part of anything that you are leading like that. Um, <laughs> the thing that I I I looked into was. Uh, the one about uh, age uh, age discrimination. Uh, we, uh, we've talked about my, my time in the business a lot of times. Uh, as an old man, I, I'm quite uh, I'm quite keen on uh, on being included, uh, just as a general rule. And and you know the thing is one, and if I can make a plug for that uh, charity, the Age Diversity Forum. I mean, these guys have done a great job. I mean, it's an ex um, uh, securities finance guy actually who's basically uh, running that, and uh, who had spent a lot of time out in the Far East, in Japan, rather like yourself. I know you've spent some time in the Far East, at all. and culturally, socially, how we relate, relate to experience is very different. You know, at the moment, there's a big trend towards sort of like these startups and it's about all young people, which is all great. You know, I've got kids of that age and so on myself. So, which is great, but I think society needs to respect the cumulative knowledge and experience so as not to make the mistakes again. And uh, so that's why that's a charity which is very close to my heart. And it also unites us. I mean, there is no um, gender, race, sex, you know, all of that kind of stuff all comes into it because we're all going to get old. Yeah, exactly. Look, and I, I think... From my my point of view, one of the things it's kind of related, but one of the impacts of uh, outsourcing over the last twenty years is that there's been a huge wealth of knowledge, particularly in things like corporate actions, that's just disappeared from London as things become automated, systematized. But ultimately, the the sort of old gray hairs that used to know the answers to problems have kind of disappeared over time. And 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 I think that's I think that's a a loss of opportunity because to me the perfect conditions are the energy and enthusiasm of those uh, of the startup generation with the experience of people that have seen things happen before because I, I will tell you there's not many things that come up that we haven't seen variations of it's never exactly the same but you know the lessons that we that we learned. Uh, in the past, I think, are easily applied to, uh, to to future developments. Yeah, I mean, you very kindly mentioned that sort of like, you know, me being the go-to guy for tax. And I think that's how we 
operate. I mean, at the moment, what we're seeing is within the securities finance industry, a structural change taking place. Okay, so the old ways of doing things are changing. There is the fintech, there is the new regulations coming in. But, you know, it's, if I want to discuss, you know, SFTR, I need to pick up the phone to Roy and sort of like say, Roy, what's your view on this? Have you seen anything like this? You know, what, what, what are the guys in Hong Kong doing about this? You know, what's the Dutch experience? And I think it's that cumulative knowledge and experience by having a forum like this webinar, kind of sort of like a podcast series, is about bringing these people together. Good. Well, I can't think of a, a better place to uh, end the podcast. So, uh, <laughs> so nice, nice job sum, summing it up, Ali. The, I, if there was one last uh, thought that you wanted to leave with listeners uh, about the area of tax and securities finance and, and the approach, or yeah, maybe that's things to look at or things to be watchful for in the coming years, what, what would your final thoughts be for uh, the listeners? Yeah, uh, I'm always reminded by that, uh, uh, the Tom Sawyer sort of like quote, which is uh, the, the news of my death were greatly exaggerated. And, uh, you know, I've been told so many times that this is it, this is the final thing. And what we've seen is there's been a real resilience. There is an underlying fundamental commercial need for this, these type of transactions. Capital markets need this. Now, the pendulum has swung the other way where we're looking at risk and controls and so on. But I think, you know, I'm very positive that we're going to come out of this, whether it's the COVID-19 or the structural changes, but with a much stronger industry where... Uh, and much stronger industry and much stronger sort of like Brazilian players. Wow. Uh, you took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, that's exactly how I see these things. Th there's a struggle. There's a challenge. Uh, there's no doubt some changes that will come, but every layer of opacity that gets peeled away from this business to me helps enshrine its future. You know, the more, the more uncertainty and lack of clarity that, that gets removed, the more likely it becomes part of you know 60 markets rather than 40 markets today and practiced by 50% of institutional investors rather than 30%. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, yeah, well said, well said. So listen, Ali, thank you very much. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, I will come back to listeners and really summarize the list of things we talked about uh, and, uh, and discuss the things that I've learned. Uh, I will leave show notes uh, to the things that you talked about, including the uh, Carl Levin um, investigation, as well as links into the Hansuki site and your webinars, which again, I encourage people to be part of. So, and you can, you definitely, you are on LinkedIn uh, probably as much as I am. <laughs> so people can always find you and Hansuki on that. And I'd encourage you to just follow uh, Hansuki and Ali to get lots of really interesting content. So thanks again. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate it. And enjoy the rest of your day. Indeed. Pleasure and honor. Thank you. And that's a wrap for this podcast with Ali Kazimi looking at taxation as it relates to securities finance. Well, I definitely learned a lot. Uh, I think Ali w took us uh, back to school and we all became students of history. The key momentous point, as he described it, was the Carl Levin led inquiry uh, in the U.S. alleging tax abuse uh, on Wall Street uh, affecting these trades. So that goes back to September 11th, 2008. Uh, many clever politicians uh, learn to bury stories uh, when uh, bigger events are going on. And certainly this seems to be uh, one of those situations, whether it was uh, explicit or just the result of uh, uh, events that uh, transpired. Uh, I guess we'll never know. Uh, but that was a useful context for the business. Uh, he then took us on to how double taxation treaties really have been changing their nature from a scenario where they're really designed originally to uh, enable uh, benefits uh, in transforming into now a vehicle where they actually prevent tax benefits from being granted. And he gave us the explanation of 
of, of the declarations that you have to make. I, I thought a particularly useful part for me was the tax evasion versus tax avoidance. Uh, one is illegal, the other is legal. And uh, Ali took us through the uh, events in uh, Denmark and through the complex Comex and ComCom trading that uh, is uh, really driving the agenda with respect to dividend arbitrage in Europe. And then finally, I thought it was interesting to hear uh, uh, Ali talk about the webinars, about the reach to the community, about diverse, diversity and inclusion, and trying to make those connections with people and, and using the webinar as uh, the key central focal point of doing that. So that's uh, that's it. Uh, I hope you learned as much as I did. Uh, for the next episode, well, we are going to uh, keep that a secret for now. <laughs> uh, that's probably due more to scheduling rather than some, uh, some unique uh, event. Um, but look, we want to give you the topics that you want to hear about. So if there's subjects that you want uh, us uh, to talk about on the episode, or if you have guests that you'd like to have, send them through to us. Um, if you want to hear more from us, please subscribe to the podcast and tell your friends. Uh, you can find us at www.peerpoint.info, uh, LinkedIn and Facebook as Peerpoint Financial Consulting, and on Twitter at Peerpoint FC. So I'll leave links to all of those things and many of the things that Ali was talking about during the episode. I'm Roy Zimmer Hansel, and I look forward to catching you next time.